channel open. Welcome back to Weekly Trek, a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions podcast network. I am your host, Alex Perry. What's today's date? The date. Today's show is recorded on February 28th, 2019, and is current through the Star Trek Discovery Season 2 episode, Light and Shadows, so beware of spoilers. All right, let's get into the show. Good day, Voyager, and welcome to A Briefing with Neelix. It's a catchy title, isn't it? Weekly Trek is a 30-minute news show covering the biggest stories from the Star Trek franchise. We are in a new golden age of Star Trek. There are four television shows at some stage of production. We're expecting at least one more announcement right around the corner and enough merchandise to fill the Bajoran wormhole. So stick with me and I'll help you sort the real facts from a lot of the Dominion propaganda that you'll find online. And my God, was this a big week for Dominion propaganda. But I can't do this alone, and my guest this week is David Majors. David, welcome to the show. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Thank you so much, Alex, for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. I I can't wait. This is an opportunity for me to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart. It's Star Trek. I'm not going to turn into a lizard, but I'm so excited I almost want to go warp 10. (laughs) Well, that is a perfect segue because I want to know something that you're loving about Star Trek at the moment. Um, So tell me the thing that is going to make you turn into a lizard. Well, and appropriately enough, because this might end up with me in in another universe altogether. I'm going to keep it nice and current. And I'm going to say that in the case of Star Trek Discovery, Uh, In the case of Star Trek and and any of the series or any television series at all, it is always such a great feeling when you find the character that you connect with. And throughout season two, I've come to the realization that for me, that character is Commander Paul Stamets in Star Trek Discovery. Oh, great. He is the character that I'm really, really connecting with for for a lot of different reasons. And and that just feels so good because uh, for all that has happened in Discovery so far, Stamets has had quite the character arc with the mycelial network and the tardigrade and the spore drive and jumping and even going all the way back to season one where he was maybe the first person to really notice that something wasn't quite right with Captain Lorca. Just uh, his entire character arc has just been absolutely phenomenal for me. And also, and th- this might get some people upset with me, at Call Me DJM, if you feel so inclined, throughout Discovery, uh, he has grown from tolerating Ensign Tilly to being okay with Tilly and, and her quirks, but still occasionally reminding her, hey, chill out. Just, just, chill out, stop talking, it's okay. And every once in a while, remember to trust the math. First of all, I mean, Anthony Rapp just gives an absolutely tremendous performance as Paul Stamets. But on the Tilly-Stamets relationship in particular, he really has taken a, a, a mentor role for Tilly, which I just think is 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 really nice. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really fun plot line. And I think you're right, he's a great character. So my pick this week is actually comes from uh, the most recent episode, Light and Shadows, and follows on from a set of scenes from two episodes ago, which is that I am really enjoying every scene between Sonequa Martin-Green's Michael Burnham and Michelle Yao's Philippa Georgiou. My favorite moment from tonight's episode, or I guess one of my favorite moments from tonight's episode, was the moment when... Giorgio tells Burnham to attack her to make it appear as though she's been overpowered so that Burnham can escape the Section 31 ship with Spot. And before she's even finished telling Burnham to do that, Michael just like punches her right in the chest. And the look of shock and in some ways a little bit of respect on Giorgio's face as delivered by Michelle Yao's performance was laugh out loud funny. I find the scenes between them to be just utterly delicious. Both of them seem to be having a really good time with turning in these performances. And it's one of the relationships on this show that I think I'm most interested and most invested in seeing going forward. David, what do you think about these two characters? That particular scene was wonderful because when I saw 
uh, Burnham hit Giorgio, uh, the thing that I said was, oh, she's been waiting to do that for a while. <laughs> that was one of those where that was cathartic, I think, for, for everyone watching to see Burnham really clock Giorgio. Of course, Sonequa Martin-Green and Michelle Yeoh are absolutely phenomenal together and as individual characters. Giorgio is a force of nature. She, she truly is played expertly by Michelle Yeoh. It, it's no shocker why a character that dynamic and a performer that dynamic would warrant her own series. It's no surprise at all. And in the case of Burnham, her emotional arc throughout the entire series so far, it has not got old, gotten old for me. Uh, for the most recent episode, seeing her continually go from being the practical science officer investigating an answer regarding her brother to being this loving family member who sees her brother Spock going through this extreme mental stress and wanting to help him, it really is a testament to the range that Sonequa Martin-Green is showing and, and She's just been excellent. Absolutely. I think there's a reason why she's the she's the series lead and she shows it to us every single week with just such fabulous performances. All right. Well, with that, let's turn to the week's top stories. There's a war going on and I'm a reporter. So we have one huge piece of news this week, which is that, as we were anticipating, Star Trek Discovery will be returning for a third season. Yay! Yay! Pop the champagne. So last week, if you were listening, I had given my theory, it was actually a bit of speculation, which was that based off of an Instagram post I had seen from Bo Yun Kim, one of the writers, that production for the season had kind of secretly started and that I thought that meant that there was a season three announcement right around the corner. And it turns out I was right. This week, Star Trek Discovery has been officially renewed for a third season with a press release announcing it, but also announced that Michelle Paradise, who joined the Discovery writing staff midway through production of season three, will be elevated to the level of showrunner, joining Alex Kurtzman, who took over as the sole showrunner in the middle of season two, following the departure of the season one showrunners, Gretchen Berg and Aaron Harberts. I think for Kurtzman, given that he's responsible for overseeing the expansion of the franchise and now the sort of five other TV shows that are at some stage of production, I think it probably is a good idea for them to have somebody who can provide Discovery all of their attention. We know the writers are back at work. That's confirmed. The at Star Trek Room Twitter account, the writer's Twitter account, tweeted a picture of a whiteboard that had 301 written on it, which shows that they have started to break the first episode of the season. And according to a trade publication, they estimate that the production for Star Trek Discovery Season 3 will begin in early July. That will likely put the Season 3 premiere at some time in the second quarter of 2020, sort of the March to May timeframe, which would make a lot of sense because we're anticipating a 10-episode first season for the as-yet-unnamed Picard show either at the end of this year or the beginning of next. So it's entirely reasonable to assume that we'll get the 10-episode Picard first season followed by Star Trek Discovery season three. So I think the one thing that does mean though, is if production for season three of Discovery is not starting until July, we probably won't have any Discovery content at San Diego Comic-Con this year, which is the first time in a few years where I don't think they will have anything new on Discovery to show, but it will be a perfect opportunity for them to provide some uh, Picard content. But David, how we feel in Star Trek Discovery is on its way back for a third season. Are you excited about that? I, I've already got a second glass of Canard because because I'm I've been celebrating since this news got out earlier today. <laughs> and I'm overjoyed. I'm absolutely overjoyed. At first, I was thinking to myself that there have been a lot of announcements for Star Trek coming out. And on one hand, I said this is fantastic because this is a franchise that I have loved my entire life and seeing more of it and seeing it go to future generations makes me happy. And this is the one that I have enjoyed more than any other kind of Star Trek content in a very, very long time. I'm 
loving Discovery on a level that I'm even surprised by. And it's not just because we just finished watching an episode. I feel this way all the time when it comes to Star Trek Discovery. It's been a long time since I have felt this way about a weekly television series. And in this day and age, with the advent of binge watching, that is lost. That you have appointment television, that you sit down and you know people everywhere are watching it at the same time as you. You can see it on social media. And then immediately after, you can talk about it and you can anticipate until the next week. And I really hope that the model for Star Trek Discovery stays the way it is. Yeah, it's fabulous. I I think, you know, we have lots to be excited about as Star Trek fans. There are a number of new shows on the way, but all of those shows are still unformed in our minds. We don't know anything about them really, right? We know the Picard show features the return of Jean-Luc Picard and not a whole lot else. We know that Lower Decks is an animated comedy. We know that Section 31 is going to feature Philippa Georgiou. But Discovery, we know. I mean, we have a season and a half's worth of content for this show now. And so I'm so pleased that what is effectively the kind of flagship television show for this latest era of Star Trek is continuing to power ahead like it has. I think it has kind of hit its stride this season and and sort of found its comfort zone. And I'm very, very happy with where things are going. And I'm looking forward to continuing to get the story of of Burnham and Saru and Stamets. And, and I am super excited for the return of Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard, but I would not want the expansion of the franchise to come at the expense of Star Trek Discovery, and it seems like it remains the crown jewel of the return of Star Trek, which I think is exactly where it deserves to be. And in my mind, there was never any doubt that Star Trek Discovery would get a season three. Um, So don't believe everything you hear on YouTube. The announcement this week just goes to show that there's no reason for us to pay any more attention to the YouTube video kings and queens of nerd bile. And that is the last that I shall talk about them on this show. So super happy that Discovery is returning for season three as well it should be. But turning from Discovery, well, we'll get back to Discovery again, but turning from Discovery to a little bit about the Picard show, uh, we got a little more clarity this week from Jonathan Frakes about his role with the return of Sir Patrick Stewart to the franchise. Frakes was appearing on a podcast this week in which he indicated that he would be directing an episode of the Picard show in its first season, and we can hear a clip from the podcast. Now, my season looks like Discovery, Star Trek Discovery, the new wonderful Star Trek series, the Picard show that Patrick is launching, and the Orville, which is some people's new Star Trek. And I just finished um, The Gifted, which is a sort of a X-Men Marvel origins show. So cool. I'm back in the uh, in that, that world. world. Yeah. yeah. And when you say you're working on those, are you both? I'm working as, yeah. a, uh, as a director. So as you can hear, in a previous uh, Hollywood Reporter interview, Jonathan had said that he was not able to say what his role in the Picard show was going to be. I think we had speculated at the time that meant that it was almost certainly very likely he would be directing an episode, and we continue to have our fingers really firmly crossed for a a Riker cameo or an appearance in the show. But now we seem to have it confirmed that he will be directing an episode of the Sir Patrick Stewart show. The other interesting thing about this interview that he did on the podcast is that he says he has seen some of the animation for the Mike McMahon animated show Lower Decks and says that it is hysterical, uh, which is great. It means that there now is animation for us to see. So hopefully at some point we will start to see a little bit more about Lower Decks. But Frakes has an excellent sense of humor. If you've ever seen him at a convention, he's really, really funny. So if he thinks Lower Decks is hysterical, I am... Uh, That gives me confidence in that project as well. But David, Jonathan Frakes, obviously he's directing two episodes of Discovery this season, but returning to direct his former castmate, Sir Patrick Stewart, how are we feeling about that? 10 out of 10. Jonathan Frakes has shown he knows Star Trek. He knows how to direct 
within this universe. Uh, he has directed episodes of TNG, uh, and I believe some of the other series, including Discovery before. Uh, I know he has been more than involved in the production of some of the, the later movies of the TNG era. He gets it. There, there's really, you can't ask for more than someone that gets it to be a part of this. Also, what this means, and, and you alluded to it, this doesn't necessarily rule out a cameo from Will Riker of some kind. It doesn't rule it out. Uh, also, uh, he said in interviews and podcasts that he's not totally moving away from acting. It's just that he's kind of dealt with the typecasting of being uh, associated with Star Trek. What? I imagine that uh, the people that are involved with the Picard series will have Jonathan Frakes there and they'd have to at least consider, hey, come on, he's right there, guys. Like, what, what, what are we doing? He's right there. So that would at least be a little bit of something, if not for the fans, if nothing else. Then Will Riker would almost certainly be involved, at least for a minute. Now, Alex. Yes, sir. I'm going to say something else that might be a little controversial. I love it. Give it to me. Because uh, as we've discussed, there is a lot of Star Trek content coming out. And yes, Jonathan Frakes mentioned that he has seen some of Star Trek Lower Decks, and he said it was hysterical. However, comma, the gentleman that is heading up Lower Decks, Mike McMahon, is the creator of the animated series Rick and Morty. I'm just going to go ahead and say that I'm not the biggest fan of Rick and Morty. So when I saw that news, Alex, I had to go to All Stop and get a visual. It was, um, yeah. But it's new Star Trek. I I'm going to keep an open mind. I love the concept. I, I think the concept could be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm I will give this a shot. I'm someone who is in no way opposed to animated Star Trek. What? This did give me pause, but I will give it a chance. Here's what I'll say about that. So I've not seen uh, Rick and Morty, so I, I don't know whether I would like it or not. But Mike McMahon has actually written a, his, he got his start with a Twitter account, a Star Trek The Next Generation Season 8 Twitter account. Oh, that was him? That was him. Yes, that was oh. him. And that was then turned into a book that was called like Warped the Eight season of Star Trek The Next Generation that you never saw, um, which were these kind of comedy pitches for additional episodes of The Next Generation if it had gone to a season eight. And I haven't read the whole book yet, but it is very high up on my list because I want to kind of dive in and read the whole thing before Lower Decks because I think it will give a really good sense of the flavor of the humor. But when the show was first announced, I did pull the book off my shelf and start flicking through it. And I was pretty impressed actually with the humor and how it fit with kind of the Star Trek milieu and so i i am kind of guardedly confident that that mike mcmahon is capable of doing more than just the rick and morty sense of humor because i know that that does appeal to a lot of people but it doesn't appeal to everybody and it potentially from what people have told me may not be appropriate for star trek but i would say to have a look at the star trek work he's done so far this and then the the short trek the escape artist which i also thought was really really funny and and, and fit really well uh so i'm not saying you're wrong at all but I think the evidence that we have around his work on Star Trek today may be that he actually does get it and that we're not getting a Star Trek version of Rick and Morty. Yeah, if we were getting that, I would be, I'd be out. And that's, I know, and that's totally fair. So switching back to Discovery, we're recording this right after Light and Shadows has premiered. And today there were a few stories, one in The Hollywood Reporter, one in Entertainment Weekly, about the Ethan Peck's appearance as Spock in this episode. The Spock tease is finally over. We got Ethan Peck as Spock on screen in this episode. He didn't have a huge amount to do, but it was still really nice to finally have, have Spock and looking forward to exploring the character more in the days ahead. But there were a couple of interviews, and I wanted to, for us to kind of talk about the Hollywood Reporter interview couple of things that I picked out from, from the interview. One, it's really interesting that when they auditioned Ethan Peck for the part, that the audition sides did not indicate that the character that he was, was auditioning for was actually Spock. They had sort of rewritten some of the scenes as though it were an Andorian character, probably to ensure that 
there would not be leaks from the actors who were auditioning saying, hey, they're going to have Spock in Star Trek Discovery season two. They had to keep the spoilers on ice. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, that's, that's why they picked an Andorian. And then the other thing I thought was really interesting was that Ethan said that he had spent a lot of time watching the original series and studying Leonard Nimoy's performance as Spock really, really closely to try and get his line delivery as close to the way that Leonard would deliver his lines as Spock as he could, which is um, an interesting approach. There are lots of actors who try not to watch previous performance of a character in order not to be too influenced and be accused of getting into imitation territory. But Ethan seems to have gone in a different direction, which I actually think for Spock is probably quite appropriate because Leonard had such a such an imprint on the character and, and made such clear choices about the way that he wanted the character to be portrayed that I'm hopeful that Ethan's portrayal will uh, will feel very much like Leonard Nimoy's. But David, how do you feel, A, about seeing Spock this evening on Light and Shadows and was there anything about this interview that particularly stood out to you? Um, for About the interview first, uh, I respect Ethan Peck's creative choices and creative decisions. Uh, within the context of the Star Trek universe, we are seeing a younger version of the Spock that we see in the original series. So it makes sense to me, just from the perspective of an actor, that Ethan Peck would want to see Leonard Nimoy's performance and take some things from that, because he is essentially playing the younger version of that character. Albeit, as we saw on this episode, going through a great deal of internal stress and psychological stress. But I understand what Ethan Peck was trying to do here it, it makes a lot of sense that to play the younger version of spock as this is 10 years before the original series he wants to play this as close to the spock that we've seen as he can while still creating a character that is uniquely his it, it makes perfect sense to me uh what we saw from the newest episode was i'm, I'm sorry everybody i'm sorry to do this Fascinating because it gave us just enough to keep us intrigued for the next episode. And it allowed Michael Burnham to use her scientific deductive mind to get into Spock's brain, which no one else has been able to do at this point. She was able to figure out what he was trying to do to get through his logic puzzle that was going on inside of his head and get us to where we are at the end of this episode. As we were talking about right before we started, after I was done uh, watching this episode, I went to go take a shower. And then, like it was scalding hot water hitting me, when Michael Burnham figured out the coordinates and said, Talos 4, <gasps> like, it, it hit me like, like the water in the shower. Just like, oh my goodness. We're, we're really going in this direction. And that, that is what this episode has been, that we're connecting the dots, not just for, for Spock, but for all of Star Trek that we know so far. Yeah, Star Trek is returning to where it began, which I think is really, really interesting. So turning to merchandise news, Eagle Moss and Hero Collector have announced the next five issues in the Star Trek Starship's collection, which is the bi-weekly Starships collection that's been going on for, I think, nearly three years now. It, we are approaching issue 150. The line is supposed to go currently through 160, though, as we talked about on a previous episode, they've also been talking about extending it. And they have announced uh, issues 146 through 150. So 145, which has previously been announced, actually now is in the hands of collectors is the Nightingale from the Voyager episode Nightingale. Issue 146 will be the Fasarius, the giant spherical ship from the original series episode The Corps of Might Maneuver. Issue 147 will be Baran's Raider from the Next Generation episode Gambit. Issue 148, the Jem'Hadar battleship, which appeared twice, once in the Valiant and then again in What You Leave Behind. Issue 149 will be the Krenim warship from the Voyager episodes uh, Before and After and Year of Hell, parts one and two. And then issue 150 will be the final variant on the Miranda class. I think we've had 
four in the collection so far, which will be the little scene USS Antares, which appeared in the background of a number of establishing shots in the sixth and seventh season of Deep Space Nine. The one where it's most prominently visible is the Deep Space Nine episode, Favor the Bold. David, are you have you collected any of the Eagle Moss ships? And do any of these pique your interest in terms of wanting to pick them up? I will say, looking at the Krenum ship from Voyager, I, I found this one really, really cool looking because it was the one that looked least like something from Star Trek. And because it was from Voyager, that means it was in the Delta Quadrant, most likely. And I think that's a testament to the conceptualization of Star Trek Voyager and the Delta Quadrant. It was so, so very alien to everything we had already established within Star Trek that this looks really, really cool in in I'm really digging this ship in particular. And our last story this week is sad news that Morgan Woodward passed away. Morgan had a long career with many credits, but he's most remembered by Star Trek fans as Dr. Simon Van Gelder in Dagger of the Mind and Captain Ronald Tracy in the Omega Glory. So uh, we wish Morgan's family the best and he will continue to live on as a member of the Star Trek franchise in our minds and in our hearts. So rest in peace, Morgan. Well, that is the facts for this week, but now let's turn to the fun part. You make some very good points, Captain, but it's still all speculation and theory. So each week I and my guest give a wish or a theory or some speculation about what we are hoping or expecting to see coming up in the Star Trek franchise. So David, let's hear your theory for this week. My theory is that the Red Angel will be something, a species that we have never seen in the Star Trek universe. Okay, tell me more. Because I I honestly think that most other speculation that I've seen, uh, fan theories across the internet about the Red Angel, maybe it's Spock from the future, maybe it's another Federation species that we already know of, I feel like that's a little too easy. And what what I've enjoyed about Discovery so much is that it is willing to push the boundaries of Star Trek as we know it. To some, maybe a little too much, but I like that. I like that it's willing to push the boundaries and go somewhere where no Star Trek series has gone before. And I'm hoping it's something new. I'm hoping it's something different because this has been a mystery. And I've always believed that mysteries are best solved when it is something brand new for us to explore. And that's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping the Red Angel is something brand new. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot of speculation after this episode that the Enterprise temporal Cold War storyline has some role to play in Discovery. And the reason I say that is because the probe that the shuttle fired into the temporal anomaly that then returned and it had a technological upgrade because it had gone into the future. They said it came from 500 years in the future, which would put it in the 28th century. And the only thing we know about the 28th century in the Star Trek canon is that's where the mysterious future guy from Star Trek Enterprise is from. But I really highly doubt that they will be going the temporal Cold War route. I think, David, you're probably more correct that they will either be coming up with something original or that they'll be drawing on on something from the Discovery mythos, something that we've seen in Discovery interpreted through a new lens. But as I've said before, I and I still feel this way after this episode, I really just have no idea where this season is going. It's not season one where we we heavily suspected that Ash Tyler was the Klingon Vogue, and that many people, though I confess I was not one of them, thought that Lorca was from the Mirror Universe. I don't think, I've not seen any theories about what people think is coming up that that I really hone in on and go, yes, you've cracked it. I think that's what's going on in this show. And so, and I'm loving that because it means that, you know, it's unfolding for me week after week and I'm not looking to have my theories confirmed or denied. So yeah, I think that's a that's 
that's definitely perfectly plausible and I think is probably up there for me in terms of in uh, very high on the list of things that I think the Red Angel will be revealed to be. I hate to end this on a downer and, and let me just preface this by speaking it into existence with my fingers crossed, hoping it happens. Six seasons in a movie, six seasons in a movie. I want it. I'm speaking it into existence. So my theory this week actually comes back to our conversation around Jonathan Frakes and the likelihood of him appearing as Riker in the Picard show. So I have no insider information. I think it will happen. And part of the reason why I think it will happen is that if you look at pictures of Jonathan Frakes, recent pictures, including from when he wrapped production on episode 12 of Star Trek Discovery, he is looking very, very fit, much fitter than I have seen him in many years, which is fabulous from just a health perspective, amazing for him to have lost quite a bit of weight and is looking really, really great. But I think that then also increases the likelihood that he will be slipping into a Starfleet uniform or some kind of late, late 24th century regalia to reprise the role of William Riker. So if he decided he was going to lose some weight and get fit purely for health reasons, rock on, Jonathan. But if it was also because that makes it more likely or because he knew that there was going to be a role for him reprising his role of William Riker in the Picard show, I also would not put that past that also being the case. So I continue to be all in on the idea of Freaks returning as Riker, and this just provides a little bit more ammunition to my argument about why I think he's going to return. I, I'm looking forward to it. And like I said, the production team behind the Picard series already tagged him as a director. So it makes me think at least one person has already thought about it. For sure. Do you have a theory or wish for Discovery or the future of the franchise that you'd like to share? Tweet them to me at Weekly Trek, and I might feature your theory in a future episode. Well, that's all the time we've got for this week's episode of Weekly Trek. Thank you so much to my guest, David Majors, for joining me today. David, how can people contact you if they want to continue the conversation? Well, if you feel so inclined, you can tweet me at CallMeDJM. Just call me DJM. That's my Twitter handle, at CallMeDJM. And you can find this show on Twitter at Weekly Trek and me personally at Alexander T. Perry. And if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast player of choice. And please check out some of the other great shows on the Tricorder Transmissions. I particularly put in a plug this week for episode 50 of Trek Ranks. That is 50 episodes that Jim Morehouse has done now of Star Trek fans reveling in their love for the franchise. If you have not already checked out an episode, I strongly, strongly encourage you to do so. And if you like our other shows, please also become considering a Patreon of Tricorder, which you can find at patreon.com slash the Tricorder Transmissions. As we talked about last week, there are a ton of new rewards available for our supporters, and we are so very grateful for the support that we receive. And lastly, if you're looking for Star Trek news on the internet, I hope you will turn to trekcore.com. Well, thank you, David. Thank you to all my listeners. And until next week, live long and prosper. Thanks a 10 forward on me.